Welcome. It's the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-based founders, executives, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. And Paul Edwards here with you, along with my co-host and partner in crime, Jason Todd. Well, actually, we're quite the partner in crime today based on the pre-interview chat. Jason Todd. Jason, good to see you again. It is fantastic to be here. I'm excited about this conversation because we're talking about a book that has not yet been written, mm. which so many authors find themselves uh, at that point a book within them that has not yet come to fruition. So Tony Castillo is here with us today to talk to us about the book he hasn't written. Tony, welcome. What's up, guys? How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. You know that because we've known each other now for uh, 15 minutes and uh, had a fantastic had a fantastic <clears throat> conversation before the podcast, which is making me even more excited about being uh, with you here today. Well, yeah, I Tony, saw you guys and I want to say, number one, thanks for having me on. Number two, I had to get my mic out because you guys just look so official. I felt like I needed a whistle. So this is my whistle and I'm excited to be on here. It's talking about the aspirational authorship. Aspirational uh, authorship. Yeah. I love that. Tony, Tony is, is, is uh, famous in certain circles for the uh, high level of energy that he brings to any conversation. And so yeah, Jason and I were both coming on. We were kind of like, you know, av our average level. And then Tony got on and it just, it went on, you know, well, he's, he's a nutritionist, right? He, he injects those, those ingredients and all of a sudden you feel like a million bucks. And so great to have you with us. I want to tell you about briefly about my nutrition, Tony, and you can then take it from here. Oh boy. Is this the left ankle right. injury? <laughs> Not the left ankle injury. Uh, although. Yeah, we'll talk about that after, <laughs> certainly after the post-interview <laughs> chat. This is, this is a faith-based show, post-interview chat. Yes. <laughs> I'm the, but uh, I'm, I'm back into sourdough making uh, for mm. bread and finally figured out my starter. So now it's a, you know, it's a nice, bubbly, fresh, amazing starter. I had been feeding it too little. And last night we made a big old piece of bread, big old new, new sourdough loaf. It was great. But took the sourdough discard and made crackers and then put on some butter with some cinnamon and some brown sugar, poured that on the crackers, and then baked them again, and then ate that and watched a movie. And I'm a little fatter than I was. <laughs> so I think something progress to go. Um, and I'm a little happy. I, well, I can't figure out why I can't seem to get this. You know, the thing around my waist to go down. Maybe you could enlighten us on, on the, the fact that I'm not actually, I talk about being healthy and I'm not healthy and it's purely by my choice. And then connect that to why you have not yet written a book. <laughs> well, because this is faith-based, I want to be honest here. I just read the Bible for the first time last year, um, from point A to point Z. And I share that because I've always been faithful. I've always believed in God. I believe in Jesus. Um, both of my parents from a Catholic background, but I read the Bible for the first time. I remember joining a group that Paul and I are in, uh, ISI, and it spoke about the foods that they ate. And I always find it so interesting that it talks about uh, almost like farm to table, right? Which is something we're learning to readopt as a culture. And the challenge is how do we feed six, well now what, 8 billion people on a planet farm to table, right? So making those sourdough breads, making those crackers, right? And that's where we come in, uh, myself as a dietitian to help educate, like, how do we feed those people? How do we keep people healthy for a long amount of time? And how does this connect to an aspiring author? We put things off until it becomes the moment, whether the doctor tells you, hey, you have type two diabetes, or you just had a heart attack. Or there was someone I worked with, he was on a golf course and he had cramps. And this was an older gentleman. He, he was a CEO, he was in his 60s and he couldn't hold his golf club because his hands were just so cramped. This is how he was holding the golf club, he couldn't. So he had to get back to the golf course and he knew that during to the, to the clubhouse and he couldn't even drive his cart because he couldn't hold on to anything, right? So it's those moments in time that lead us to look for help. So for myself as an aspiring author, it's those times like, all right, I have a talk coming up. Wouldn't it be great if I had a book that I could give out, right? Uh, coming on a podcast where authors are on. Wouldn't it be great if I had a book to talk about? <laughs> so there's also the shortcuts we take, 
not only with our diet, but in writing a book. I can tell you about a year ago when I did start writing the book, um, I had, who is the person I'm writing this to? And then I had chapters written out. And what I was told was, because I have a lot of film content. So take the film content, transcribe it, then put it into chat GPT, the shortcut. But let me tell you, every time you take a shortcut, there's reasons they're called shortcuts and there is the problem. I would put it into chat GPT and it didn't sound like me at all. It sounded like a robot and I could teach it all the things I wanted to about how I talk and it still wouldn't put out the content the way I wanted it to. So it's the same thing with diet. We're looking for all these new quick fixes. Uh, we could talk about Ozempic, Wagovi, all these GLP-1s, semi-glutides, injectables that people are now doing and paying an exorbitant amount of money for. But you can't sustain because you're not yeah. listening to your inner self. You're not listening to your hunger cues. You're not eating real food. You keep doing things and expecting different results, right? So going back to the crackers with cinnamon and sugar and butter, which are all delicious. Heck, that was a snack I grew up with, not on crackers, but on bread. Uh, it's just, we keep trying to get the shortcuts, but it's, you have to sit down and do the work. And that's how we bring it full circle. <laughs> I love that you, I love that you bring that up, Tony, the, <clears throat> the whole thing about AI and I have respect for AI and Jason and I are already experimenting with ways that we can use it in our business. But when it does come to authentically channeling that author's voice, um, Jason, we've, we've had a back and forth about this. I think it's, it's, it's an appropriate time to mention it just to give the audience context of the limitations of an artificial intelligence machine, right? Because the, <clears throat> as we've talked about in the past, right, it, it, you can talk to it, you can try to teach it how you speak, but you can't teach it to listen for what you don't say, right? You can't, you can't teach it to, uh, to know when it's said too much or when it hasn't said enough. It has no concept of that in terms of relating and empathizing with an audience who's going to pick it up and read it. And that's sort of, um, I see the parallel there now that you mentioned that Tony between uh, the shortcuts there and the shortcuts uh, by using the, you know, semaglutides and, and ozempic because your body is still seeking nourishment from real food and you're not giving it to it. You're just depriving it. Well, that's the body's like, okay, fine, but I'm not going to, you know, that's not going to change anything. Uh, particularly my attitudes towards food psychologically, particularly my my appetite for it once you go off the semaglutides and ozempic um, and i began to think of that right away when i heard about people using those substances so let's talk a little bit about that well i would even like to go back to what you said the stuff that we don't talk about that chat gbt may not pick up when you're an author it's what i like to tell my clients the blts the bites licks and tastes um it is not bacon lettuce and tomato which is also a very delicious sandwich but the bites, licks, and taste. So when I work with someone, whatever their goals are, whether they're trying to lose body fat, gain muscle, improve performance, it's the bites, licks, and taste that add up. And it's the things mm -hmm. that they don't tell me that seem to falter through. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Having kids. If they decide not to eat their dinner, they leave something on the plate. As a parent, either the mother or the father, someone's going to take a bite and eat that. That's the bite that they don't report. Uh, someone's eating something and just have a lick of ice cream. Oh, it's just a lick, right? Uh, I, I heard it this morning at the gym. Uh, this, the gentleman said he has six different flavors of ice cream in his uh, freezer. And it's always that he's going to go, I'm just going to have one scoop. Right. And then you forget about it because you don't think about it. You have that one scoop and then it becomes a whole ball. Right. And then yeah. the taste, you're just tasting something. Right. Whether you're going out to eat, you might just have a chip, but you have half the basket. The same thing. What is the chat GPT not picking up when I'm trying to convey my message? Right. Because yeah. I'm not just conveying a message of nutrition that has been seen time and time again. I give the foundational pieces. And I think that's what we're missing, not only in nutrition, but even in authorship. Right. What are the foundational pieces I could be doing to write this book? And I'm, I'm looking for that next hack to make it easier because I've been told since I was in first grade that I would never speak English. Uh, both my parents are from Dominican Republic. My first grade teacher sat with my mother in first grade and said, your son is never going to speak English. And I grew up here. I was born here. And I was just very shy because I spoke Spanish at home, English in the classroom. And let me tell you, after that first class, my mom put me in the English after school activities. Everyone was doing sports. I was having to read books, write, and I hated it because I was like, why can't I be outside with my friends? 
right? So I think that's one of the barriers I have personally of writing a book because I have that mentality of first grade Tony coming in and saying, no, man, you aren't meant to do this. You're, you're just mm. supposed to just sit back, right? So sometimes it's that inner critic. It's not only the bites, licks, and tastes or the secret or what Chad GBT isn't telling us, but we have that inner critic saying, this isn't the time you were meant what to do What are we telling it. ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. A parallel that I hear is in working out. So CrossFit came on the scene a number of years ago. I owned a CrossFit gym for a bit. And CrossFit made a huge difference in my workout life because it had the elements for working out that that the typical gym did not have. Uh, and so because it had those elements, it worked very well for me. One of the tenets of, of CrossFit or uh, cross-functional movement uh, is that you use all parts of your body while lifting stuff. Whereas strength training tends to focus on a particular uh, area. Like today is, you know, right arm day. Best day. Well, like if you do, if you do right arm day all the time, you're going to have one hell of a right arm. And <laughs> the rest of your, right. And the rest of your body is going to yeah. compensate for it. And I feel like that's in some ways the, the short circuiting or the, uh, the, um, what are we calling it? The, the fast, the fast method. The shortcut. The shortcut. Shortcut. Thank you. I, my brain is stuck on short circuiting. The, uh, the, the shortcut, right? The shortcut method, um, denies the development of all of the things that are connected to that one activity. So for instance, um, if a person cannot rein in their eating because it's a decision, first and foremost, it is a decision. If you can't rein in that decision, what other strengths are you not developing in terms of decision making that you don't even know you're sacrificing because yeah. you're like, I don't want to address the reason I can't make this decision. I'd rather just take this thing that now allows me to stay in my bad decision making, my weak decision making for that matter. Uh, and I feel like I'm getting some benefit in this one area, but it is way out of balance with a fully developed life. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing in this, which we can tie that back into, you know, let's chat GPT a book. That's not going to be your life. It's going to be mm -hmm. some semblance of what everybody else has written hey. in addition to maybe the central concept that you had, but it's not your life and there's less value in that. Mm. Yeah. And I'm also and someone who promotes authenticity. So if I go ahead and I do a chat GPT book, that's not me. I'm being inauthentic right. to myself and my brand. And that lack of authenticity, I think is what stopped me because that was the guidance I was given to, well, one of the guidances I was given to writing a book. And then there's always like, sit down and write. Uh, that's of course been a struggle. So it, it's almost, it's very parallel to nutrition, right? Like just sit down and write down what you're eating. That's a good start, right? But then we forget the bite flicks and tastes as mentioned earlier. So sit down and write and put it in G chat GPT. But what about the other stuff that's not in there that you wanted to put in there, right? And yeah. then that inauthenticity and then the imposter syndrome, right? Well, and going into a gym, especially in January, everyone's scared to go in. Everyone says they're ready to go in, but they go in and they see the guy that's already been doing this yeah. for years and he's ripped and then you don't want to go in anymore because he might just be coming in and being helpful and be like, hey, why don't you try this out? Or you have the other side of it where the guy is ripped and he's trying to train you and you're like, I don't need your help right now, buddy. Uh, I'm nowhere near where you're at. So I think it's, it's a lot of that. And, you know, out of curiosity, what do you guys tell authors that you've worked with how to write a book? What, what are the steps for someone that is an aspiring author? Well, one of the things uh, that I'd like to bridge this gap into your question is all of the an ancillary benefits of writing a book. One of the benefits I think people discount if they're particularly if they're writing a book like a, I want to have a lead magnet for my coaching business or something like that, right? They focus too much on the benefit they're, lo they're looking for and, and uh, don't give enough value to the ancillary benefits because you went through the process as process of distilling all of your thoughts, you have concentrated the communication in a way that you wouldn't have been able to do having a thousand conversations. Yeah. And that is a serious benefit, I think, for people who want to 
expose parts of their lives and the lessons that they've learned or give tools and techniques. The clarification process of writing a book has a magic across a, a lot of disciplines in or areas in a person's life that have nothing at all to do with the fact that you're going to be able to put this book in front of somebody. And that I think is, so what, when we're looking at what is the counsel for people who are thinking about writing a book, one of the things is really getting, get not only in contact with the why that you want to write a book, but, uh, like I told an author yesterday, give me that keynote. If you're going to stand in front of 5,000 people, what are you going to say? Mm. What's that one thing? Cause if you don't know yet, know that one thing, you've not even developed enough value in your own self. And, and if you did say, Hey, I'm going to stand in front of 5,000 people, the value that's going to come out of that discussion in your own head is going to impact your afternoon. It's going to impact tomorrow. It's certainly going to impact a book and it might impact the world. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, piggyback on that, Tony, and just say, you know, when, because I've written the books that I have when people ask me about, you know, what I'm, I'm looking for creative ways to network and build relationships with people. I can, I can spit it out of my head easily and in very simple, memorable phrases that I spent a lot of time working on. And so even though my book might get in front of somebody one day who wants me to come and give a talk and, you know, I get a speaking fee or gets in front of somebody who says, I want to work with this guy as, as my publisher and ghostwriter. That's wonderful. I, I mean, I, I have that expectation and that hope too, but I can't ever discount the fact that when people come to me and they say, I, I want to get more effective when I'm out there at conferences and events, what should I do? I immediately have an, you know, a ready arsenal of different strategies to, to explain before them, uh, to help them move down the tracks. And if I end up getting invited on a podcast or a TV show and people want to talk about what's in the book, you know, it's there it's, and it's there permanently because I went through that lengthy process of explaining it in detail and providing concrete examples. And there's all these stories I can access. And what, what ends up happening <clears throat> a lot of times you observe this rightly or wrongly with politicians, which is why we tell our, our authors becoming an emissary author is kind of like running for national office. Right. You're going to go through one interview after another, after another, you're going to do signing after signing, and you're going to do, um, radio and TV spots, and you're going to do, um, write-ups in the, in, in, in publications where you're going to be discussing what you talk about in the book. And that's a lot of what pol uh, politicians do. They, they work with their campaign staff to develop a very concrete message. They have a series of talking points. And they go from one stage to the next, to the next one rally to the next, to the next. And they say the same thing over and over and over again, until the message resonates and sinks in with the audience. And they say, I'm voting for that person. And so <laughs> uh, obviously becoming a published author is not, you're not, um, necessarily getting a political office out of it, but you are getting a sort of an office in the mind of the reader in the mind of the of the, uh, observer who, you know, when that topic comes up to them, when it becomes important to them, it might already be important to them. They're going to automatically gravitate towards what you say versus what Joe Schmo, who does the same thing down the road, but they have no idea who he is has to say, because they don't even hear him. He hasn't put, he hasn't gone to the trouble of putting himself out there in a distilled product that you can easily consume and say. That's, that's the message I need to hear. I love that. I think uh, personally, the parallels I see from the nutritional side is you have to live and eat what you breathe or breathe what you eat and live. You get what I'm trying to say here. See, <laughs> it's one of those Jason's things that favorite, yeah. Jason's favorite phrase for that is eat our own dog food. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So eating our own dog food, right? Like. If I were to tell you that I want you to focus on hydration, but you never see me drinking water, you're like, dude, what are you, why are you even talking? Right. Yeah. If I'm telling you to eat more whole foods, but you see me out at McDonald's every day, you're like, come on, man, what are you talking about? I'm practicing what you preach. 
So having a book just really firmly puts in that you're practicing what you're preaching and here it is, here it is point blank. And going to all those rallies, you're saying the same thing over and over again because you want to make sure you're saying the right things. You're saying things that work for you, right? And how do you get it so that the masses understand that it could work for them and that you can help them with it? And I, that book is what makes that uh, platform available. Yeah, I like the, what you're bringing out there is accountability to the message. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's one of the hurdles that people subconsciously are trying to get over or through that they don't realize. It's the fact that when you put your message out there, you're now accountable for it. And so many people, I think, live as though they, they say, I want to write a book. Yeah, but I don't want, I don't want people reading it. You know, so it's like, I want to write a book, but I only the people who I want to read it can read it because I don't want to, you know, get criticized by these people. And I don't want to hear about it from these people. And, and it's because of that, not wanting to be held accountable for your words that then they sacrifice just giving the message to the world. And you talked about authenticity, uh, you know, and I think part of the root of this uh, desire to be authentic is to be seen. And so many people are don't want to be seen. I want to tell you my message, but I don't want you to see me. And those two are incongruous. Those thoughts are incongruous with one another. To be able to move people, to be able to connect with people, you must allow yourself to be seen. And if you're going to put yourself in a book, that's part of being seen and people are going to come criticize you for it. Are you okay with that? And that's kind of like the, um, you know, fat guy goes to the gym videos, right? Yeah. It's like he's 350 pounds and that man, everybody knows he's overweight. He knows he's overweight. He's sweating in the corner. Some people are chuckling at him. Other people are applauding him for finally getting to the gym. Yeah. Right. And it, and he decided, you know, it's enough, enough is enough. I'm going to be held accountable to who I say I want to be. And I'm going to be seen. I'm going to be exposed in front of all these people who are going to, who some people are going to criticize me, criticize me as I grow and become better and change, why do I care about their criticism? And I think that in this idea of, of should I write a book? Can I write a book? Maybe now's the time to write a book. If there's that criticism, if you're afraid of the criticism, uh, do you even want to be like these people? Because if you don't, you don't worry about the, what they think either. And don't about criticism from other authors, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there who are writing books that frankly aren't worth reading. Um, I'm not going to name anybody. I'm just simply saying, you know, they're out there. And, um, but, but then, you know, that until you follow through with it, they enjoy an advantage, which I find equally wrong because if you've got a message that, uh, is, is authentic and can impact the world and move people in a certain direction that's meaningful and um, develops them either personally, professionally, or spiritually, uh, you have no business keeping that message to yourself. It's not for you. I, it, it is for you, but it's not just for you, right? Anytime we get stuff like that, we get those, we, we get access to that inside loop where we get out of ourselves, the physical condition we want or the growth in our careers or, um, the, the better understanding of, uh, of, of the message of the Bible of spirituality and that kind of thing. Um, there's, there, there's always with it an obligation to pass on what you've learned, I believe. And, uh, to that end, you know, you're sacrificing the advantage if you don't follow through with it and you're seeding it. If, if you got these people over here who have written books, even though they're crappy ones, um, you're seeding advantage territory. You should never be giving away to them because their books aren't even worth reading. You could run rings around them, but you have to, you just, you, you know, it's like, it's like that, that old saying, right? You don't, you don't have to, uh, be great to get started, but you do have to get started to be great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that image of the 350 pound guy in the corner just speaks volumes to me personally, because that's just how I feel in a, in a room of authors. Right. I was told at first grade, I'd never be able to speak English. And it's just like, all right, now I'm trying to give out information about nutrition and English to help people. So is it really worth it for me to do it? Or am I still that little kid? 
it, it's scary, right? Being an aspiring author, but I, it just goes back to that comment you just said, Paul, right? It, you got to start. And I think that's the challenge. So man, just got to start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I, um, would like to hear from you, Tony, you know, you work with people who are on their health journeys and usually, uh, like you talked about before, there's usually a, a moment like, okay, now it's time, right? It's like, we've been talking about this for the last decade. I keep getting bigger. So I'll buy bigger pants, uh, you know, or like, I'm going to wear sweatpants and wear my jeans when it's nice, you know, when I go out for a nice dinner, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and then there's this moment and usually it's like, ah, I should have done that, you know, two years ago type, type of moment. Um, but I look at this idea of preparation for opportunity. Why do we educate ourselves? A lot of times it's to prepare us for a new opportunity. We prepare our minds for new opportunity. Why do we take tend to our spiritual development? Well, to prepare us for a new opportunity. For our bodies, we're preparing ourselves. Our, they're very resilient, beyond resilient. Like the kind of crap we eat, and how we treat ourselves, like most animals would die if their diets varied so much. Yeah. You know, like you can pack a lot of nonsense down a, a human and that thing will keep on going. It's amazing, right? A lot of grace, a lot of leeway. Um, but when we tend to our bodies, we prepare ourselves for future opportunity. Things that we never would have been able to participate in, things we never would have seen or be connected to in any way had we not gone, gone through that preparation, which gets me back to the idea of uh, the ancillary, the connected opportunity, which comes into our lives when we treat ourselves. I like to think about it this way. Treat yourself as your best friend. How would you treat your best friend? I guarantee you, most of us tre would treat our best friend much differently than we treat ourselves. No. Yeah. So, Tony, what are your thoughts? That is absolutely right. It just reminds me of the people that I've worked with when they feel like they're not having progress. They look in the mirror, they look at the scale and the way they talk to themselves, I step in, I'm like, would you talk to your best friend like that? And they said, absolutely not, right? Most people wouldn't. They're, we are kinder to others than they, we are to ourselves. We are the harshest critics to ourselves. And I see it time and time again. No matter what the moment is, people are still harsh because no matter how old you are, you've been eating, eating your whole life. And as long as you live, you'll be eating. I don't care what you do. You got to eat. One thing we always have to do now, how you choose to eat and how you live your life, that's really based upon you and what you want to do. And that's what I see every day because sometimes we see people who use the food to soothe themselves, right? Maybe they're stressed out about the book they're writing and now they're just overeating or they do the opposite side of the plunge where they decide not to eat because they haven't written their book and they're punishing their body for not doing what it should be. And it's not running optimally. And as you said, the body will survive. The body is always looking for a way to survive. The question is, are you trying to do it at an optimal level or just pass by? Are you trying to survive or are you trying to thrive? And that's the real question. Mm -hmm. It comes down to nutrition, right? Like I, I see people time and time again, they're like, oh no, I, I saw this advice from whoever. I'm like, that's great, but there's no science backing to it. And what you're doing is you're putting your wishes in a hope and it's going to lead you to the same place you've been doing time and time again. Why not just do the foundational things and do them right? Uh, I mean, I worked in the pro athlete field. I worked at, at Major League Baseball. I worked at the University of Florida as a dietitian. So I help people that are Olympic athletes fuel their bodies. And it wasn't anything crazy. If we think about it, supplements are the only one to 3% that make the difference. The other 97% to 99% is what they eat. And if they don't have the foundations right, I don't care who they are, they are not going to be the best athlete. And the same thing with an author, with anyone, any person, you're not going to be the best person if you're not nourishing your body. So mm -hmm. I, I love that thought process around it. And I think it's so simple. A lot of these things are very simple, you know, like nutrition, the baselines of nutrition are not difficult. It's a lot of saying no to things that we commonly call food. That's, I mean, that's, if you just look at it that way, redefine what you think is food. Mm -hmm. And that's like, it's not that difficult. It's a lot of saying no. Uh, in writing a book, I talk to people, you know, say something and start anywhere. No. That's it. Say something, start anywhere. Don't even start with an outline. I gotta, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna say. No, you don't. You, what you need to do is you need to start saying something. 
and write it down. And you might find that after you write it all down, it's a journal entry and it doesn't need to go further than you. There's some, some things are for me and some things are for thee. But until you write it down, you won't know. So write it down. Either way, it's going to edify your own soul. It's going to prepare your mind and your heart for opportunity. And like, just like nutrition, start saying no to things that aren't food and you'll fill it in with the things that are, and you will prepare your body for opportunity. You, can you exist another way? For sure. Absolutely. Can you exist better or at least see opportunity and be prepared for it when it comes? You can, there is a way to exist better. Yeah. I have a, I have a thought here, Tony, as sort of a, it's from some of the stuff you've mentioned and maybe you've tried stuff like this already. And maybe, uh, maybe this is just for the people watching or listening, but, um, I want to go back to what you said about the, uh, the inner voice that's constantly questioning you. And um, it's constantly questioning you. I don't know the inner framework of that, how much, you know, where you came from and your background and, and all of that play into it. But the, 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 uh, the bell that it seems to keep ringing at you is um, fine, but not in English, right? you were told you weren't supposed to learn English. Therefore, even today, even though you communicate every day in English, you can't communicate in English, right? Yeah. It's my preferred language. <laughs> well, it's, you know, um, so, so, but, 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 but here's what I want to get to. And, and I hope, I hope this helps somebody. Um, in the nutrition world, you probably do your fair share of challenges to people, right? The 30 day challenge, the 21 day challenge, whatever it is, right? I went through this exercise one time. This was probably just at the end of 2022. Um, and it really did, it really made up, uh, a, tr a tremendous shift in my life with regard to that inner voice. And for me, the whole thing was I, I could not escape, um, viewing myself as a contemptible person internally, but I was listening to a podcast one day where the guy said, I want to challenge you to a 30 day process of spending time every single day, writing down reasons you are worthy of love. And I was in their Facebook group as well. And I posted and I said, challenge accepted. And I will post in this group every day to let you know I've done it. And if it's, you know, if people want to see what I've written, I'll share what I've written. You know, I'll put a screenshot and all that. And so I began every morning I would, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a big writer, obviously, but I would, I would get there and I would write, I am worthy of love because last night. Um, I gave my, my bride a neck rub, uh, this morning I took my clothes out of the dryer and put them away. Uh, I took my kids to school. I <laughs> called a friend of mine and introduced him to someone else, right? These are not unlovable behaviors, right? They're, they may be very perfunctory and very ordinary. Doesn't make them, it doesn't make them worthless and it, and it certainly doesn't make them evil. Right. And so I kept doing this and I would, you know, I got to the point where I was filling pages every day of the littlest things I could think of that were worthy of love. And 30 days later, I suddenly realized that whenever that critic came to spew his contempt, I had 30 pages of data that I could stick in his face and say, <laughs> prove it. Right. And, uh, it has been amazing ever since then, all of last year, continuing into this year, uh, how quiet he's been. He just doesn't say a word. And if he does, I hear him instantly. And I'm like, ah, 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 ah. nope, nope. Want to see my, want to see my diary entry again? Oh, and then he goes away. So my thought to you, <laughs> trying to put it in a little bit of context 
is um, maybe you could do with an exercise for 30 days where you, you document every single interaction you have in English, right? My whole day. I talk to my wife in English. I talk to my kids in English. I, uh, called customer service in English, right? I wrote down this to-do list and checked it off in English and 30 days later, right? When, when that critic comes and says, ah, 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 30 pages in English, <laughs> I'm not yeah. kidding. I, like I, the, this, this revolutionized my life with the inner critic in, in ways nothing else ever has. Now I, I you know, I'm not making guarantees here. Everybody's different, but, um, something like that, that <clears throat> it's, it's the data it's, it's when that voice knows better because it, it knows that the data has been documented and written down, right? It's like trying to challenge your physician on the, <clears throat> on the value of taking your blood pressure and your heart rate. You can't challenge it. You can't. It's settled science. Yeah. Right. And we have the opportunity to do the same thing. Sorry for yelling, by the way, <laughs> on the episode. It all, it all worked up. We're getting the energy out. out. You, you started at the beginning, Paul. People are going to be like, wow, he really got Paul riled up. He really did bring energy. <laughs> Paul he got Paul to in that nerve. <laughs> I, oh, well, I, 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 hate to see people, I hate to see people held back by their inner critic. Okay. You got a physical handicap. You, you, you know, anything like that. That's, that's a separate issue. But when you internally believe something that is manifestly, obviously not true, right? Um, that's the, I mean, that's at the core of the emissary mission. We're about putting out messages just like that to say, uh -uh, no, not true at all. Not true at all. You are not stuck where you are, right? Uh, you, you can, I mean, we're in the middle of crafting one right now. I can't give the details. It's just it's phenomenal though. And so I get like passionate when I see this kind of stuff and I'm like, I know there are ways around this. I may not know the way around it, but I know they exist. So. Okay. Uh, I'll react to that, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I, in my career where how I see it in my world is just people who have that negative self-talk, like my body doesn't do what it does. And I'm like, for the next week, right? Every day, one thing you're, you love about your body, what it's able to do. You're able to go for a run. You like the way your hair is. I've had people be like, I like the way my brain thinks. It's those simple things so that when you have that inner critic coming back, you have something to say. I just haven't learned how to look in the mirror. And as I learned from a mentor of mine, one finger pointing at you, but four pointing back at me. Yeah. Right. So it's that same, same thing. Like who, who am I trying to target and why am I that, that way? So I, I love that. One of the things that connected with me, Paul, um, as you waxed philosophically, I didn't mean um, to go on a philosophical bent here on the emissary author podcast, by the course way, you didn't. legal disclaimer, you okay, stop go ahead. apologizing for that. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> uh, but I remember that it, Part of my process it was making a website for myself and listing out, taking a complete inventory of all the things that I've done personally and professionally in my life, mm -hmm. because it's been a lot, like yeah. a lot more than most anybody that I know. And I was afraid to own all of that because one of my fears was, and it goes back to a kid like a young kid thing. One of my fears was being somehow, uh, set apart in a, right. in kind of like a, well, who does he think he is? It's like, I'm just a kid who likes to go down to the Creek and play with fish and program and sing and goof off and, you know, stand up in front of people and give a big keynote. Like I'm all of these things. And I, and so I wanted to just kind of shuffle all that back and be like, I'm not going to tell anybody I have built five companies. I'm not going to tell anybody I've done audio recording. I'm not going to tell anybody I've passed for churches. I'm not going to tell yeah. like nobody's going to know me because I'm never going to expose it. Instead, yeah. I'll use these things in this, you know, strategic way, which then held me back from all, from all sorts of, I think, positive connections. And, um, and also helped me back, I think from, from doing the things that I knew, like I knew I could have influence in certain areas. And, uh, and it was, it, I think it was just that process of self inventory, mm. which actually allowed me to, to grow and mature, I think in ways to own 
the positive qualities and also on the negative qualities rather than just being staying small, like the yeah. expanse of yourself. And I think that's a, that is a book writing process. I think it's a, a nutrition topic because it's anytime we butt up against our growth, there's always something usually internally that is telling us don't expose. No, don't talk about this stuff. You know, what do you, what are your, what are your thoughts, Tony? I mean, I've seen it. You're, you're growing back to that 350 pound guy at the gym. I've worked with that guy and he doesn't want to lose weight because then he's not the, pe the person people look at in the room. He's not the center of attention anymore, whether it's good or bad, mm -hmm. right? It's scary to see what happens once the body changes and they don't take up as much space and they don't know what to do with that and vice versa. Those that are looking to gain weight, they want to take up more space and they feel like they don't. So it's almost like losing that piece of yourself. And I mean that both in the weight, but also the internal piece of losing a part of you. And it's scary because you know that it could be helpful, but it's scary. Yeah. Well, at, so as we wind down this podcast, I think one of the things th that really stands out for me on, in terms of like your nutrition coaching and how you work with folks is the root of our eating, our overeating, our bad decision-making, you know, over time, uh, you know, our sy systemic bad decision-making, you know, it's one thing to be like tonight, I'm going to eat all the crackers in the world, <laughs> you know, and cover them with butter and sugar. <laughs> like you can do that sometimes you can't do it every night or yeah. you'll, you know, you'll turn into a cracker, uh, <laughs> let the anyhow, but the, I, I think our systemic, the roots of all of those things are how we want to show up. Are we willing, do we actually want to take on the responsibility of showing up? and growing because that is a different level of responsibility. And sometimes we don't want that responsibility. We don't want the responsibility of our decision-making. We yeah. don't want to be seen all of these things, which hinder us from actually stepping into our opportunity and what we are capable of. Carolyn McHugh is last I'll say, and then Tony, you can give us your ending thoughts here. Carolyn McHugh, she did a great Ted, TEDx talk and there's a statement that she says, she said, her quote is, most of us don't take up nearly the space the universe intended for us. Yeah. And I think so many people reach a point where they're like, there's got to be something more. And they think, well, it's because I'm not skinny or healthy. It's because I've not written my book. It's because it's like, no, no, no. Those are the effects of a mindset that wants you to be small. Yeah. For whatever reason, or wants you to be in control for whatever reason. And until you get to that, the rest of it is going to be, ah, man, I wish I would have done that. Maybe I'll write that book. Maybe I'll get to the gym. Maybe I'll hire a nutrition coach. Tony, I call that the band aid on the broken leg. You keep yeah. trying to fix a broken leg with the band aid, but nothing's happening. And that's what so many of us do with nutrition. Uh, we try to do what is the quick fix thing we see online. Well, it's low carb, it's keto, it's carnivore, it's this, but it's like, you haven't addressed any of the issues that you dealt with your whole life. Yeah. I mean, we could come on here and I could do a whole nother podcast about my own challenges growing up. I was, grew up in a household where I had to eat cheese balls in my house because I couldn't have them in my, in my house because my mom thought she'd eat them all. So I didn't eat them in my room. Like, imagine that's how I grew up, like having to store food in my room. Um, it's just interesting that if we don't address that root cause and we don't get to it and we don't have a personalized plan on how to get out of it, how do we expect to change, right? And it goes back to writing a book. If you don't know what you're going to do or why you're writing it, and then you don't have a plan or strategy on how you're going to write it, it's never going to be written. No matter how many chat GPTs say they're going to write it for you, it's not going to come out like you. <sighs> the Band-Aid on the Broken Leg. That could, make a, that could make a chapter title right there in a book. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Put it down. Chapter well, two. Well, said. I mean, in English too. I mean, like, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, we have had a fantastic time bantering about, uh, all things philosophical and nutritional and literary here on the Emissary Authors podcast with our guest, Tony Castillo. Tony, where should we send people if they want to learn more about you and, uh, read some of the, uh, 
in the English fantastic material you've put out there to help people learn how to improve their nutrition. Absolutely. They can go to nutritionfp.com backslash EAP, which stands for Emissary Authors Podcast. Uh, so it is Nutrition FP, which stands for performance, nutritionfp.com backslash EAP. And on there, there's three things. The first one, they get a 10 question wellness quiz to see how their wellness is. I'll give them a response back with video. The second thing is they can download a 30 day habit guide. So talking about challenges of how I'm going to do better and overcome my own fear of being the first grader. Uh, it is similar, but it's about how to change your habit. Then it's a video and a tracker that you can change your habits on three things in regards to nutrition that I use a lot with my clients. And the last one, if they felt like they really like me and they want to connect with me, they can fill out an application, which now we've been accepting health insurance and it's getting a lot of people free sessions with us uh, and our team, uh, 100% uh, paid for, covered by insurance. So it's been really great because we've been able to help people move the needle on nutrition and find ways that goes to the root cause and they stop putting the Band-Aid on the broken leg and uh, nutritionfp.com backslash EAP. And just a reminder, I was in that same boat uh, when it came to nutrition. I thought there's no way I could do this. I tried all the bro science that was out there and it just didn't work. It wasn't until I got my degree in nutrition and started working with athletes and seeing their relationship with food and how they fueled that got me to where I am today. So uh, thank you guys again for having me on. I thought this was fantastic for my aspiring authorship. And I have a challenge for myself to do. Bro science. I'm starting to think of some, I'm starting to think of some planet fitness commercials here. <laughs> now, it's been great having you on, Tony. Thanks so much. My name is Paul Edwards. Jason Todd is my co-host. And this is the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we help faith-driven founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs tell the stories that matter. And we'll see you next time.